this is the final topic of this unit, uh, talking about the mechanical properties of bone connective tissue and some of the things that happen with aging of the tissues. So one of the things that we need to think about regarding the material properties of bone and connective tissue uh, is stress. And stress comes in a lot of different types. There's pressure, uh, which is force over cross-sectional area, which is defined here, but there's also tensile stress, which is going in the opposite direction, twisting stress, bending stress, uh, and shear stress, which we'll all talk about over the next few minutes. Uh, and the response to stress is strain. So strain, narrowly defined, is a change in shape of the structure in response to stress. So, for example, uh, if a ligament is subjected to tensile stress, uh, it will stretch out, and that is a change in length over original length, which is a percentage strain. Two types of strain are elastic deformation, uh, which is when a structure is able to return to its original shape or height or length, uh, and plastic deformation, which is when the change in shape of that structure is permanent. An interesting and important thing about stress-strain relationships are the variations. So the amount of deformation from stress depends upon the type of tissue that we're talking about, uh, the type of load that's applied. Remember, we were talking about bending, stress, compression, tension, all these different things. Uh, the point of application of the stress, uh, the direction of the load, uh, the magnitude of the load, and the rate and duration of the load. Now, I don't know why we are collapsing these tank cars, uh, but they are responding to the stress and it is cool to see. Uh, now these uh, figures here are demonstrating tensile and compressive stress. Uh, so we have a figure with some geometric shapes uh, over on the left uh, that are resting and we see them elongated uh, on the middle drawing and then we see them compressed so uh, longer horizontal and shorter vertically uh, when they're under compression. Shear is a type of stress that is faced in the body frequently. Uh, the illustration on the top shows if there are two structures, one sliding across the other uh, because of shear force. This is what happens between joints a lot of the time. Uh, and this is why, as we were talking about in the last lecture, uh, we have a tangential arrangement of collagen fibers on top of the most superficial layer of articular cartilage. Those collagen fibers protect the collagen underneath against the shear forces. Um, on the bottom is a figure uh, that might represent a solid uh, structure uh, subjected to shear forces. So what will happen under those circumstances is that the structure will deform. So this might be uh, something like a bone itself or perhaps a labrum or meniscus within a joint. Bending is a very common type of stress that is faced especially by the bones in the body. Uh, and what happens when subjected to a bending stress is that one side of the bent structure, such as the shaft of the bone, uh, is placed under compression. Uh, and one side under tension, uh, rather as is demonstrated by the drawing that you see on the right side of the slide. Now, what happens because of what's called the piezoelectrical effect, which is a phenomenon that happens with crystalline tissues, including bone because of the calcium that is embedded into it, uh, is that on the compressed side or with compression, uh, you have a negative charge, and on the side that's under tension, you have a positive charge. Now, you may remember that in physiology, when you see electricity in the human body, it's always a result of the movement of ions, and this is how this happens in this case as well. Anyway, what happens because of that charge uh, that we see is that osteoblasts, which lay down the tissue, 
uh, are stimulated by the negative charge uh, and osteoclast, which dig tunnels through and resorb the bone tissue, are stimula stimulated by the positive charge. And this is one of the ways that bone is remodeled in response to stresses. Torsion is a type of loading that can cause a variety of different types of stresses within the structure depending upon the location and orientation of the material within the structure that we are thinking about. It can cause shear, compression, or tension as demonstrated in the two drawings on the right side of the slide. When we think about the material properties of the structures in the human body, the strength uh, is the magnitude uh, of load at which that structure fails or breaks. And there we are, all breaking. Many of the structures of the body are viscoelastic. That means that the stiffness depends upon the velocity of a loading. The faster a structure is loaded, the stiffer it is, and conversely, uh, the slower uh, a structure is loaded, uh, the softer it is. Uh, now, bones are among the viscoelastic materials, so on the one hand, uh, that stiffness that increases with velocity of loading uh, has a really important effect on the behavior of fractures, which is why fractures caused by gunshot injury are so devastating. Of course, fractures caused by gunshot injury take place at a really high velocity, and this is why those fractures tend to be widely commuted fractures or fractures where the bone just shatters because of the high velocity of loading, the bone becomes very stiff, stores up a ton of energy, and then fails, and it explodes when it fails. However, an example of the opposite uh, is demonstrated in this experiment. So what happened here was that a vertebral motion segment of two vertebra and an intervening intervertebral disc uh, were dissected out and put into this compressive machine, uh, which compressed this anatomical specimen uh, with a, at a constant rate. Uh, and what the diagram shows is that the longer the compression took place, the less force it took to cause the compression. So in effect, the bone is softening uh, the longer the compression is applied. Hysteresis is a property of viscoelastic materials. What hysteresis means is that not all of the energy that is imparted to a structure or a material is returned. Uh, so for example, we might think of this drawing here as a tricep surrey with the Achilles tendon. Uh, and if a person is running or jumping, uh, the green line, which I'm outlining right now, is the amount of energy that is being imparted uh, into the structure. However, the red line, which is on the bottom, is the amount of energy returned. So if you remember from calculus, for example, the integral is much smaller. The important thing, even if you didn't take calculus, uh, is that there is an amount of the amount of energy returned is less than the amount of energy that is put into the structure. So one of the discussion questions that we're going to think about this week is what happens to that energy. Since Einstein has taught us, energy cannot be destroyed. As we were describing before, the stiffness and strength of materials is related to the direction of the application of force. And stiffness and strength can really be thought of as similar things. Uh, the resistance against deformation in the case of stiffness or the resistance to breaking in the case of strength. So we'll consider bone, for instance. And what you see in this diagram is that bone is very strong 
against forces that are applied longitudinally, so forces that are applied in the direction of the shaft of the bone. And as the forces uh, shift from longitudinal to transverse, the bone gets weaker and weaker, so that bones are able only to sustain around one half of the force uh, applied transversely to the bone compared to force applied longitudinally. A lot of the reason for this has to do with the construction of the cortical bone. Uh, cortical bone being the bone tissue on the outside, which is relatively solid. Uh, so that bone is arranged in columns which have layers called lamella, which run the length of the shaft of the bone. Uh, those columns are actually arranged around what are called haversion canals. Haversion canals are where capillaries go through. Uh, and also inside what are called lacuna, uh, within the lamella or layers of these columns or bones uh, are the osteocytes, which are cells which have evolved from osteoblasts but maintain the bone tissue. Because of these layered columns of bone uh, running longitudinally, uh, bone is very, very strong against compressive force and not so strong against shear force or force that is applied transversely to it. Also within bone and contributing considerably to the strength of that bone are what are called trabeculum. Trabeculum are threads of bone within the cortical bone. Uh, and although individually they're very thin, uh, collectively they are quite strong and really important because the trabecular bone is very responsive to the forces that are imparted to the bone. So I'm going to demonstrate. You can see some of the trabeculum if you look carefully at this uh, radiograph of the distal femur, but I'm going to show you some. So here, for instance, uh, is what is called the supporting bundle uh, of trabeculum within the head of the femur, and over here is called the arcuate bundle. You can see, if you, again, if you look carefully, uh, how the bone is much denser in radiograph, and it is so because of the trabeculum. Collagen, we've talked about quite a bit over the course of this semester. Uh, but it is some really important stuff. It's the major structural component of many human tissues, and when it is mature and healthy, it has a very high tensile strength. Uh, and as we have talked about before, it is white in color. Uh, there are other proteins within the connective tissue. One, uh, which was named by somebody probably with very little imagination, is called elastin. Elastin is pretty much what it sounds like. Uh, it is there to provide elasticity and is actually yellow in color. Here we see a couple of stress strain curves. On the left is that of collagen, and on the right is that of elastin. Uh, and you can see that uh, the collagen starts increasing in. stress right away when you begin to elongate it uh, to the point of plastic deformation and then finally breakage over here, as opposed to the elastin. The elastin has a very high degree of elastic deformation, all where it can restore to its normal length before it actually reaches plastic deformation and ultimate failure. Tendons have a much lower proportion of elastin relative to collagen compared to ligaments. Uh, that makes sense because tendons are attached to muscles. And we know about muscles is that they're actually very elastic by construction. Uh, ten ligaments, on the other hand, uh, connect bones. Uh, so there is not a tensile stress absorbing mechanism for ligaments like there is for Tendons. So ligaments uh, have what is called a crimp, uh, which is also here in this hairstyle that hasn't been popular for quite a while, but the model over here in this picture has crimped hair. 
And that's kind of what uh, we see actually in electron micrographs of ligamentous tissue. Uh, that crimp is maintained by elastin. I've got a diagram on the next slide which will help explain that. Uh, and that is an energy absorbing mechanism. So when the ligaments are put under tensile stress, uh, like a valgus stress for the medial collateral ligament, the first thing that happens is that that stress is absorbed by the crimp of the collagen. This is a drawing that I've made uh, meant to demonstrate how the crimp in collagen is maintained. So the wavy black lines are meant to represent the collagen uh, and the straight yellow lines are meant to represent the elastin. Uh, so what happens is that the elastin is attached to the peaks of these waves. Um, but when there is a high tensile stress, uh, it will straighten out these waves, but in the waviness, uh, a force attenuation mechanism exists, which helps prevent uh, the ligaments from being plastically deformed too easily. We've discussed quite a bit about articular cartilage in the past lecture, uh, but you remember that articular cartilage has a very high proportion of water uh, and you may not know that it is also a viscoelastic material. So uh, like the other visco viscoelastic materials, the faster it is loaded, the stiffer it becomes against deformation. Uh, it has a very limited vascularity. Remember the only place it has a little bit of vascularity is right against the subchondral surface of the bone, uh, but still has needs for nutrition and oxygenation. So what we need is compressive loading. And as we had calculated uh, earlier in the semester, compressive loading on the joints can be quite high indeed. However, uh, the joint surfaces actually thrive on that high compressive loaded so long as it is applied cyclically, uh, allowing it to squeeze out the synovial fluid that bathes and nourishes it and soak back in during low compression. So what happens to these tissues when we don't treat them? Any tissue has an amount of loading that it can adapt to and become stronger and healthier. Uh, if there is too much loading, uh, then they can lead to injury and not enough loading, it can lead to hypertrophy. Either one can lead to death. So in bone, for example, uh, we need compressive loading in order to stimulate the osteoblastic activity. Bone doesn't need loading for nutrition and oxygenation, such as cartilage does. So for cartilage, uh, what is more important is not that it be really heavy loading, but that it be frequent loading. Uh, in order to decompress and compress the tissues. But under any circumstances, uh, both of those tissues need the right amount of load without um, sufficient loading, the health of the tissue can diminish and eventually the tissues die. But also with excessive loading, the health of the tissues diminish and die for different reasons. This is an example of a study uh, that was done with rhesus monkeys. What they did to these poor monkeys uh, was they put them in body casts and hung them on a wall. Uh, and what they found is revealed in this diagram here. So uh, the strength of the monkeys who had had a normal two months uh, previous to that, after before being sacrificed and having their vertebral bodies uh, removed and subjected to compressive loading to failure uh, is the top, the strength of the vertebra of the rhesus monkeys that had been immobilized for two months uh, is on the bottom. And you see that the strength, both the strength to failure and the strength against deformation uh, have diminished to less than half. I think, in fact, it's about 31%.
of that which you would expect for the normal bone. This is a diagram showing what can happen with cartilage. So remember we were talking about how with cartilage we have the tangential layer of collagen fibers that help protect the surface of the collagen uh, against shear loading. So if we have overloading, then we lose that protective layer of collagen fibers and the collagen just wears away uh, as the protective tangential layer uh, is no longer there uh, to help guard it against the shear forces. On the other hand, if you don't have enough loading, uh, then you don't have nutrition and oxygenation of the cells within the tissue. And without sufficient uh, nutrition and oxygenation, those cells die and both the collagen uh, and the glycosaminoglycans will eventually die as well because they are not maintained by the chondrocytes and fibrocytes, which we need to keep those tissues healthy. And this is just a summary of the things that we had talked about over the past 21 minutes.